The Great Upheaval, America and the Birth of the Modern World, 1788 to 1800 by Jay Winnick, book review. So this is a history book. Uh, I bought this book 10 years ago. I actually stumbled upon it in an airport bookstore. I, I was just browsing at the time. I, I'm a history nerd, but if you've been watching this channel, you know I've got rather niche interests. I, I uh, tend to go ever, after kind of rather obscure stuff. Uh, I'm not particularly academic, but I, I like to get into kind of this niche stuff, and I don't normally pick up history books in the airport bookstore. Uh, but I saw this, I was browsing through it, and it looked just so interesting as I was browsing through it, and it, it looked like it was really well written, just, you know, the parts I would skim through. So I thought, yeah, I, I'm gonna pick this one up, and it turned out to be really interesting and really well written. So uh, that's my mini review of this. Really interesting, really well written, I I'd recommend it. So the book is subtitled, America and the Birth of the Modern World, 1788 to 1800. And the thesis of this book, so to speak, is it focuses on what's going on in France, America, and Russia from 1788 to 1800, and it tries to connect them all. Uh, the, the thesis is that the world was very interconnected even back then, so like globalism is not a new thing. So what was happening in America had a direct impact on Paris, and what was happening in Paris had a direct impact on Moscow, and what was happening in Moscow had a direct impact on Washington, D.C., uh, etc. So, so that's the thesis of this book. Now, there, there's already been a lot written about the American Revolution and the French Revolution, right? The, the dual revolutions at the end of the, sorry, the dual Republican revolutions at the end of the 18th centuries, both, uh, both having kind of a similar ideological basis, Voltaire and the Enlightenment and all that kind of stuff. Um, What's interesting about this book, well, there's a couple interesting things about it. First of all, uh, the subtitle, you'll notice that it's the timeline starts at 1788, meaning the American Revolution is all finished. Uh, the, the American uh, government has established itself. And so this is more about what's, how the French Revolution impacted American politics then vice versa, because the American Revolution is all finished at this point. And, and this was interesting. I, I didn't really know how the French Revolution played out in American domestic politics. This, this hadn't really been covered in my history classes at school. We talked about the American Revolution, we talked about the French Revolution, but in, at least in my high school, we never really talked about how the French Revolution impacted American domestic politics. So, so that was interesting. But then what's also interesting is the addition of Russia into the picture, right? Because everyone always talks about the connection between the French and American Revolution, but nobody ever thinks about Russia during that time. So, so adding what was going on in Moscow uh, made this much more interesting as well. Um, plus, Jay Winnick is just a really good writer. Uh, I, I know this is a little bit cliche to say, but uh, this is a history book that read like a novel, at, at least at times, not all of it, but, but the better, more descriptive parts of it read like a novel. And the best way to illustrate this is just to quote this. So I'm, I'm going to quote from an extended section talking about the French Revolution here. Apologies in advance for my mispronunciation of all the French names. But this is a section when Danton and Camille Desmoulins, two French revolutionaries who were both instrumental at the beginning of the French Revolution, um, but they've been victims of a power struggle uh, within it and victims of Robespierre, and now they're being carted off to the guillotine. So begin scene, quote, it was a cloudless spring day when the condemned men were carried off in five tumbrils to the familiar Place de la Revolution, like the monarchists before them, like the king and queen, like the non-refractory priests, like their friends and colleagues from the convention. Even the radical leader Herbert had been cut down less than two weeks before. <laughs> 
Danton was 34, and so was Desmolins. It seemed like an eternity, and perhaps it was, since that fateful moment when Camille had risen up and extorted Parisians to head for the Bastille. Passing through a huge and silent crowd, Danton bore up well. Not so Desmolins, who was near the cracking point. Leaning over the red painted tumbril, he meekly appealed to the people. I was the first apostle of liberty. It was I that called the people to arms at the beginning. Pausing at the house where Robespierre lived, Danton, defiant as ever, rose up to his feet and shrieked once more, I am leaving everything in a frightful mess. Not a man of them had an idea of government. Robespierre will follow me. Ah, better be a poor fisherman than to muck about with this politics. By now, night was falling. Reaching the scaffold, Desmolins was third in line, Danton last. Thus, he could hear the whistle and thud as the blade fell on all the heads before him. For a fleeting moment, he faltered, then roused himself, muttering, Courage, Danton, no weakness. As he approached the blood-splattered plank, he altered the ghastly ritual, extorting Sanson, the executioner. Don't forget to show my head to the people. It's worth the trouble. A hush fell over the crowd. Eight days later, it would be Lucille Desmolins, along with Herbert's widow and his commune compatriot, Pierre Gaspard Chamat, taking their turns at the guillotine. The ledger was now wiped clean. Isn't that great? Uh, it's, it's great the way when Nick hooks you in with the writing and then just carries you along through the scene. If you like history, you're going to love this book. It's just fascinating historical descriptions throughout like that. On the negative side, well, not so much negative, but maybe a little bit of nitpicks. Uh, the narrative sections do kind of get broken up with more analysis sections, uh, which I thought slowed the momentum down of the, of the book. Also, I don't think the analysis sections were all that intelligent. They seemed a bit fluffy to me. And while I'm complaining about the analysis sections, the author Jay Winnick has a habit of asking his own rhetorical questions and then answering them, uh, which is a device that gets a little bit overused. Um, gr it graded on me a little bit near the end, but on the whole, it's a great read. Um, now, this isn't, if, if this book had been like an academic thesis, uh, it probably would have gotten marked down for going on digressions which are not strictly related to his thesis. But it's not an academic thesis. It's it's a it's a book. It's it's a history book for the for entertainment mostly. So uh, I, I think some of this can be and should be allowed. So uh, his, his thesis again is that everything was interrelated. What was happening in Moscow was related to what was happening in Paris, which was related to what was happening in Washington. That being said, a lot of the tangents he goes off about what was happening in Moscow don't seem to have a direct relation to what was happening in Paris and Washington. So the, the Moscow sections, his thesis of everything being interrelated seems a little bit weak here. Uh, th there's some stuff that's interrelated. Uh, Catherine the Great of Russia was, was a big fan of the Enlightenment initially, uh, but then after what she, she saw what was happening in the French Revolution, uh, she, she completely reversed track on that. So there is some stuff that's interrelated, but there's also a lot here about Catherine the Great's uh, war against the Muslim Ottoman Empire, which really does seem to have minimal inf influence to what was happening in Paris and Washington. But it's interesting. Now, this book was written and it came out during the Bush years with the Iraq War. So it was specifically written 
to have some relevance to what was in contemporary events. Uh, namely, this, this Western superpower, which attacks a Muslim country and then gets bogged down in this awful war of attrition that they don't know how to get out of. Uh, and, and the parallels to what was happening in Iraq at the time that this book was written are right there. But there are also some interesting connections to the American Revolution. I, I, I said before the connections were minimal, but, but they are there. So uh, John Paul Jones, who maybe you remember from your American history classes, he was a guy who was fighting the British Navy and he, he gave this famous quote, I have not yet begun to fight. So it turns out, after the American War of Revolution, he became like a private agent for hire and he ended up in Russia in Catherine the Great's court and he was hired by her as a, as a private privateer to fight in the war against the Ottoman Empire. So, so there's a connection there between America and Moscow. It, it's, it's a little bit stretching things, but it's there. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, the, the, the whole thing about the Russian war against the Ottoman Empire w was really interesting. I was a little bit more frustrated by some of the sections on the French Revolution. Um, namely, uh, the sections on the French Revolution focus entirely, almost entirely, on the royal family. Uh, King Louis, uh, Louis the Sixth, excuse me, Louis the Sixteenth. Marie Antoinette. I, I mentioned before in one of my previous reviews, I've got this theory that when the French write about the French Revolution, they tend to focus on the Republicans, you know, the, the, the convention, the tennis court, or oath, the third estate, etc. Uh, when the British write about the French Revolution, they tend to focus on the royal family. And Americans, you would think Americans with their Republican sympathies, would focus on the Republican aspect of it, but uh, American historians seem to have, or at least American popular writers, seem to have picked up from the British uh, this focus on the royal family. Uh, and Jay Winnick does this as well here. The, the, the whole of the French Revolution is viewed through the lens of the hardships of the royal family and King Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. Now, not that they didn't suffer, and certainly that's a story that deserves to be told somewhere, but I think the much more interesting thing going on here is the Republican uh, conventions. And, and that side of the story just gets completely dropped. Now, uh, once uh, King Louis and Marie Antoinette get their heads chopped off, then the focus does go to Robespierre and the Jacobins and, and uh, the... the the reign of terror. Uh, and, and that extended quotation I gave earlier illustrates that. And, and that, that gets well told, but at that point, the early Republican ideals of the French Revolution are long gone anyways. And at, at that point, it's just watching it descend into more and more chaos. So it, it would have been nice, it would have been nice to have more description of the early days of the French Revolution from the perspective of, of the Republicans. Uh, I, I thought that was unfortunate. Um, okay, other things that got dropped. Um, when you think of the connections between the American Revolution and the French Revolution, I, I think the two names that pop out are Lafayette, who was a prominent figure in the American Revolution, and a very prominent figure, at least in the early days of the French Revolution, and Thomas Paine who was a uh, yeah, very prominent person in the American Revolution and participated in the French Revolution. Interestingly enough, for whatever reason, uh, neither Lafayette nor Thomas Paine make up any of the narrative sections of this history. Their, their stories just get pretty much dropped. They get mentioned in some of the analytic sections, um, but very briefly. So that was a little bit disappointing, but... I guess to be fair, uh, this book is covering three countries over the course of 12 years, and there are a lot of historical giants that need to get covered. In fact, I, I didn't really realize uh, 
until I read this book, just how many historical giants were living during this time period, right? So you've got George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Voltaire, Benjamin Franklin, Madison, Adams, Robespierre, Lafayette, Thomas Paine, Danton, Mirabeau, John Paul Jones, Catherine the Great, Marie Antoinette, Talleyrand, Napoleon, etc., etc., etc. It's no wonder that uh, author Jay Winnick can't do justice to all of them. So, so some stuff does get dropped. Sorry, uh, one, one last quick note here. The subtitle of this book, it's subtitled America and the Birth of the Modern World. However, when you actually read it, uh, the sections on the French Revolution make up the bulk of the book. So, so the, the majority of the storytelling in this book is about what was happening in Paris. I suspect that subtitle America and the Birth of the Modern World was imposed by the publisher, you know, maybe to sell more copies in America or I don't know. That being said, uh, it would be exaggerating to, to say there was nothing about America here. Uh, like I said, uh, there is some interesting stuff here about the impact of the French Revolution on American domestic politics in the late 1780s and 1790s. Uh, there were also some very interesting sections on America in here, so it, it would be an exaggeration to say there was nothing. Uh, the rivalry between Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton and Adams and Burr was all very interesting. Uh, the 1880 election and all the mess surrounding that was quite interesting. So th there are some very interesting things about America in here as well. Okay, one final, final quibble. Uh, there is an index in this book, but it's not great. Uh, it could be a lot better. Uh, and especially in a book like this where there are so many names flying back and forth, quite often I would go back to the index to try and remind me about who a certain character was or to remind me about what had been happening to a character. And the index was just not as thorough as it should have been. So that's, that's, that's a minor quibble. Overall, uh, this is a totally interesting book. I bought it in the airport 10 years ago. It's probably not being sold in airports anymore. I, I don't know if it's still in bookstores or if you need to track it down on Amazon. But it's, it's worth tr tracking down. Uh, if you're a history nerd, track this one down. It's a fascinating read.